Okay, good afternoon. Um, it's time for, for us to get started. So to plan for today is to go over the, the lecture material one more time, just to review the, the a methodology uh, that we explain about how to compute the, the size of the carriers for a conveyor. And then we're gonna have an exercise a lab assignment that you're going to start working here in the classroom. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to work on it. And then we'll discuss it in class uh, to clarify any questions that you might have. And then after that, I posted the, the exam grades. So those are available. Performance was very good. In the average was around 89 something. So I was very, very uh, happy with the, with the performance. Uh, but we will we'll still discuss the, the exam at the end of the of the lecture time. So we'll go, I'm gonna open the questions and, and then we'll have uh, some time to, to discuss the questions and the answers. So that's the plan for today. So let's, let's begin with the review of our uh, material for, for Monday in which we discuss the conveyor models. Uh, and as I explained, we have two different type of, of models that we are going to discuss in class. The first one are the deterministic loading and unloading sequences. And then we're going to discuss the stochastic case in which we're going to have some Poisson arrivals, some uncertainty in terms of the arrivals to the system. And we're going to use that information to also help us with our design. So, uh, so we are focusing on specific conveyor models. Uh, in, in, in our discussion last time, we we're focusing on these trolley and similar conveyors in which you have some discrete carriers and you want to uh, design and you want to know how, how much space you need to have on each one of these carriers, depending on the amount that you have in the conveyor. So, um, so we present two types of models for conveyors with discrete carriers. Can hear. Okay, so let me see if I can fix that. Okay, so it looks like it's a problem. Uh, it's just for one of the students, not for all of them. So try to figure out what what is happening with your computer. So we present two type of models. Again, uh, the first model, which is what we discussed last time, uh, was focusing on these discrete carriers or a deterministic model. So you have something like this, you have a, a carrier and you want to identify or you want to compute the space that you should have in that conveyor in order to make it uh, efficient for your process. So, um, so there were some problems. Obviously this type of analysis came because we are trying to solve a problem. And these are the most common problems that are identified for the, the type of conveyor that we are trying to design. So at loading station, non-empty carriers were available when you need to perform some type of loading operation. And on the other side, if you are in an unloading station, there were no loaded carriers uh, to unload uh, or to perform the oper operation of unloading. Um, so let's go straight to, to our um, design uh, for deterministic loading and unloading sequences. So these are the, this is the, the scenario that we are trying to, to design for. Uh, you have a set of stations or work stations located around the conveyor. And each one of these stations can perform the loading and unloading of an item into these carriers that are attached to the conveyor. So there are S stations located around the conveyor, number in reverse sequence to the rotation of the conveyor. Each station can perform loading and or unloading. 
into these carriers. And there are K carriers um, equally spaced around the conveyor. Those are represented here by this uh, dots uh, in, on top of the line. So the passage of carrier by a workstation establishes the increment of time used to define the material loading and unloading sequences. So again, we have a conveyor, we have a fixed path. In, each, in this fixed path, we have these carriers that are located equally spaced. We have a, the total number of carriers that we have uh, for the system, and we are trying to design for the capacity of these carriers. And around the conveyor, we have a set of uh, stations that are used for loading and unloading purposes. Uh, we use station one as a reference point to define the time. And then consequently, after you move after a carrier n becomes carrier n plus k after passing this station. So if you have seven stations, once you go around the, the station, you go back to the first one, then you're starting the, the sequence again. Um, the sequence of points in time at which carrier passes station one is denoted by TN, uh, where TN is the time at which the carrier N passes station one or station one. Uh, the amount of material that is loaded on carrier N as it passes station I is given by FI of N. So N is the carrier number, I is the station number. Uh, so if you have f of one of three means that in station three, um, sorry, station one, we are loading this many items in carrier three, n equals three. Uh, the amount of material carried by the carrier n immediately after passing station i is h i n, which is essentially the summation of whatever you had in the car plus what you're loading um, into that car after passing uh, that station. And we know that each carrier will, will be able to hold multiple items. Uh, so under steady state operation, the total amount of material loaded on the conveyor must equal the total amount of material unloaded. So we know what goes in goes out. Uh, so it's, it is assumed that the conveyor will be operated over an infinite period of time. The sequences f of i of n are assumed to be periodic. <clears throat> so we are going to have a period P and, and we are going to compute these amounts for um, each uh, period. Additionally, we know that this is the conservation of flow. So we know that at the end, the summation has to be zero. Um, in analyzing the conveyor, we have the following relation, which is capital F of one of N, which is equal to the summation of uh, from I which is the station number up to all stations, the summation of all the flows uh, for each card. And we can obtain the following results. So these are the three uh, results that we, we need to make sure that those are satisfied in order for this uh, methodology to, to work. Uh, K, which is the, the number uh, of periods. Um, I'm sorry, K um, is the, the total number of cars, mod p, which is the period, k over p cannot be an integer in steady state operation. And the operation r equals k mod p must be, r over p must be a proper fraction. So r, we, we discussed how to compute r in, in our previous lecture, but we have some examples here. So that's the reminder of two uh, operators. So 12 mod 7 is going to be equal to 5, 26 mod, say, uh, mod a will be equal to 2. Uh, and we want P to be a prime number. It, it doesn't have to be, but it will be preferred for P to be a prime number. P is the period. And then we have the material balance equation for carrier N can be given by, by this H1 of N. Um, and then in order to determine the, the values of each HI, the following approach is taken. So we look at the, this iterative uh, process in which we are going to be computing this uh, amount is one star of n. And we are going to make h1 star of one equal to zero. So the first card that is passing the first stage, and we're going to assume that we start with an empty system. Um, so we are going to use this 
to find the next value for h i plus one star. We make this assumption and then we use that assumption to compute the rest of the h star values using this equation. And once we get all the values for h star of i plus one, Meaning that we, we look at, if we have two stations, we have to compute it for both stations. We have three stations. We have to compute it for all three stations. We can go to the next step in which we find C, which is the minimum of all the H star values. And then we're gonna use that C value to compute the H I N value for all uh, stations. And then the capacity. So the required capacity per carrier is going to be equal to B equal max of HI of A. It seems like um, we have a good understanding based on what I'm seeing in the in the audience. Um, any questions of what we are doing here? Okay, so um, so let let I think it would be better if I let you work on the lab and then we can try to to address more questions. Um, so go ahead and open lab seven, I'm sorry, lab six. Um, it is available in uh, Canvas. If you don't have access to Canvas, I'm going to open the, the exercise here. So this is what we have. It's essentially the same uh, system but instead of having nine carriers, now we have 10. Um, so we have this situation. We have two stations. Um, we have 10 carriers equally spaced, and we want to determine the required capacity per carrier. We have this uh, flow, loading and unloading sequences uh, that also occur at P equals seven, and they are given here. Uh, for F1 and F2. And again, the same is the same system, but now we are designing for a uh, problem in which we have, instead of 10 carriers, we have, instead of nine carriers, we have 10. Um, so let's see how, how, how we can uh, address this problem. I'll let you work on this for, let's say about 10 minutes, and then we, we can start answering some questions. So again, if you just make it to class, this is lab six. It is uh, posted online, but if you don't have a computer, that's okay. The, the exercise is here. Uh, so this is what I want you to try to solve. Sorry.
This is the value of R. Right. So are the requirements uh, met for this problem? Do you check on those? K over P is not an integer, right? R over P is a proper fraction and P is a prime number. Okay, so we proceed with the uh, computation of uh, the amount that is uh, inside each part after passing uh, station one. But in order for us to know that, we need to compute F, capital F of one first. And that will be the summation of little f of one plus little f of two for each period.
So now you have the capital F values for each one of the periods. You know the value of H1 star for one or carrier one, which is equal to zero. So now you, you have all, all the pieces of information that are needed for you to solve this equation. Uh, but remember the value you have is for n equals one. So if you um, if you want to substitute that value into this equation in here, um, the value of n that you are you are going to be searching for, right? So you make sure that this difference equals one. You have the value of r, which is three. So for n minus r to be equal to one. N is to be equal to four. So that's the next uh, period that you are going to uh, compute for. I'm sorry, the, the carrier that you're going to compute for, which is going to be N minus R, R equals three, N is to be equal to four. So you will be solving this equation now for uh, carrier four. So what I'm saying is, for this to be equal to one, and this to be equal to four. So you can apply this relationship. H one star has to be four, right? Because that's the only way that this value, which is needed for So for n minus r to be equal to uh, one, n is to be equal to four. So h one star of four will be equal to h one star of one plus f of one of four. Yes. Yes. Um, so you're not subtracting, you're adding. It's one plus minus one. Yes. So the idea here is that you're using this value that you have on hand. If you want to use that value, you have to make sure that when you, you want to use it here, because you're using that as a reference point, the only reason this n minus r is going to be equal to one is when n equals four. So n minus, if n minus r is going to be one, you're going to use this value here. But for you to be able to use that value here, you have to make sure that this is consistent. This is an expression for n. This is an expression for n. n minus r is four minus three. So n for you has to be four on this one. Uh, Professor Perez? Yes. The sound is kind of weird. Uh, maybe if you uh, speak closer to the microphone, it might be better. Maybe there's a level. Yeah, up. I'm sorry. I was, I was walking into the screen. So that's why you didn't uh, hear very well. Um, <laughs> so what I'm saying is, um, you, you are using this expression h uh, one of star equals h one uh, one star of n minus r. So you're using h one of zero as your uh, initial value. 
in order for you to use that initial value, you have to make sure that the, the rest of the equation is consistent. So for you to use H1 uh, start of one in this equation, n has to be equal to four. And that's what, what we did for the first uh, iteration. Thank you. So now we have H1 start of four equals two, and we can repeat this expression, um, repeat the process using H1 start of four as our value for the next one. So, um, So the next one, now we want this difference n minus r to be equal to four. So for that to be equal to four, n is to be equal to seven, right? So the next value that we are going to compute is for uh, carrier seven. So likewise, One start of seven will be equal to H one start of four. This is two plus minus four. And this is minus two. If you try the next one, something interesting is going to happen. Remember your period is seven and you are going into 10. That value, uh, remember the, the, these periods are repeated, right? So once we get above seven, we go back to one, two, three, four, five, seven, go back to one through three, four, five, seven. Uh, so instead of going up to 10, we're gonna, restart the, the cycle or the period. So we go from seven to one through three. So the next um, item or the next uh, carrier that we are gonna compute for is for um, three. So let me write that down here. So next, H1 star of 10 is obtained however since p equals 7 H1 star of 10 will be equal to H1 start of three. Hence, H1 star of three will be equal to H1 star of seven plus F of one of three. So it's going to be fifty minus two. Okay, so for the purpose of your submission, you have to show me how to compute uh, the rest of the values will be H1 start of six, 
h1 start of 2 and h1 start of 5. Okay, so you follow the same dynamic. Um, oh, let's, let, me, let me give you a couple of minutes for you to do that. <coughs> Find the, the rest of them. Um, we have h of 1, we have h of 4, h of 7, h of 3. So somebody will tell me how much h of 6. is one of two and is one of five. Anybody got H1 start of six? That's correct. H1 star of two. Negative three, that's correct. H1 star of five. Negative one, correct. So again, I'm gonna write the, so let me make this very clear. I'm gonna write the results here, but you have to show me how to get those results in your solution, okay? If you don't show me, just copy what, what I did here, you're gonna lose some points. Okay, so you have to show me how to get H1 start of six, minus four, H1 start of two, minus three, H1 start of five, minus one. Okay, so we got the, values for this set. So this set H1 star of N equals zero minus three, zero, two, minus one, minus four, and minus two. So next step is to find these H star values for station two. So we got the values for one, for station one. Now we have to find the values for station two. Um, so the values for station two are found using these relations. Let me change the color. Uh, the values for two star of n are seen using the relation relation a two star n equals h one star of n minus f of one of n.
So see that f, the little f value is for station one. It's our reference point, right? So we're gonna get the values for one, f one. Um, and we're gonna subtract that from h uh, one star of n. So what that means is we have the following h bless you and this set is going to be equal to 0 minus 3 0 2 minus 1 minus 4 minus 2 all this minus one minus one minus four minus two zero minus three minus five minus three. Okay, so what's next? So we have both sets now. Let me highlight that. So we have this set and this set. So the, the next step is to find the minimum value from these two sets. So based on our inspection, you can see that the minimum here is minus five. Okay, so that's what we're gonna call C. So let me show you. So I show you here is just the same that we just did. Now we're getting into this point. C. Uh, is going to be equal to the minimum of all hi star values. And as we saw, that minimum is five, right? That would be base number right here. So minus five is what we have identified as the, as the minimum. So with that minimum value, now we can compute the, the set for HI without the star. That set is gonna be equal to the HI star values minus the C value that we just found. Yes, so the, the, after you get the H star value, the rest is straightforward. Yeah. It's just completing the, the formulas. So once we get this value, then we can just subtract H star R N from both steps. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at this set right here and this set right here. H1 star and H2 star. And we're going to subtract for each one of those numbers minus five. So it's going to be, for example, zero minus minus five. Right, so. So for H1, 
is going to be zero minus minus five. That is going to be equal to five. For the next one is going to be minus three minus minus five. That's going to equal to two. The next one is zero minus minus five. That's going to be equal to five. Next one, two minus minus five equals seven. This number right here, seven. Um, minus one minus minus five. Gonna be equal to four. You got all this. Minus four minus minus five is one. Minus two minus minus five equals three. Now we look at the set for H2 and we, we do the same process. Minus one minus minus five is four. Minus four minus minus five is one. Minus two minus minus five is equals three. Zero minus minus five is five. Minus three minus minus five is two. Minus five minus minus five is zero. And minus five, I'm sorry, minus three, minus minus five is two. Okay, so once we have computed the values for both sets, the last part is just to identify the maximum. So this is basically saying that the maximum number of items that you will see on any car, I'm sorry, that will be in car four, will be seven after passing station one. So that will be the maximum number of items that a car will hold. So when you're designing for your conveyor, based on steady state, the system will need at least a space for seven on each of those cars, because you know that will be the maximum uh, load that they will have to hold in steady state. Questions? Okay, so you have until midnight to submit this uh, lab. So make sure that you uh, take a picture or scan this before you forget um, and upload your solution to, to Canvas. Okay, so the next thing for today, any questions? Questions? Yes. I don't know, maybe I got the wrong one. Uh, this for H2 star, H1 star, you got, anybody else, you got it? Okay. Any other question? Okay, so let's talk about the, the exam. So as today you should be able I just released the scores before class. So if you don't have a computer with you, you might not have seen your scores yet, uh, but those are available already. And again, the performance was, was good. I'm going to go over the questions with you now. Uh, if you lose points, most of the people that lose points is because they were using um something different uh that what was explaining class for some of the problems uh different methodology or maybe um yeah so they were using the wrong process to to solve the problems um some of you had some problems computing i mean some miscalculations so if that's the case you got 
couple of points off from the problem. Uh, but in general, it was a, a good uh, performance. So here are the questions. So question one, uh, for the multiple choice, supply chain management is concerned with the management and control of material information and finances. So all of them, all of the above. In facilities planning, Structural system consider column spacing materials and configuration. So that was the first one. Um, one of the major problems in facilities thermal performance is how to make effective use of the solar gain. Question three. Question four. Life safety systems are designed to control emergency situations that would disrupt normal operations, such as uh, all of the above. So power failure, fire, seismic events. Question five, the total area required for a park uh, automobile depends, excuse me, of the size, on the size of the parking space, the parking angle and the L width, I width. Yes. Question six, the recommended minimum number of toilets in a facility is determined on, um, the number of occupants and the type of business. Which of the followings um, is the primary goal of uh, office design to minimize the communication costs? Or, uh, number two. The office layout has uh, extensive use of partition and is the most uh, common layout is the open plan. Question nine, in supply chain, the following three are logistical drivers of performance, uh, inventory, transportation, and facilities. Number two there. And then sourcing is the set of processes required to purchase goods and services in a supply chain. Okay, so then we have three questions that were problems similar, very similar to what we uh, cover in class. So the first one was asking about the heat loss of the facility having the following characteristics. Uh, if the inside temperature is 75 Fahrenheit and the outside temperature is 18 Fahrenheit. So you have the numbers here. So what I found here was some of you got the right number, but then were having difficulties with the uh, decimal, where to place the decimal points. So the number of figures were off. Uh, so that made the final computation to be wrong. So I took a, a couple of points uh, if that was the case. And if, if you got, well, I mean, some of the students got the QI, uh, computation wrong. Uh, other than that, I think most of you got this problem uh, correct. So if you if you got a score that was not what you were expecting, you are welcome to meet with me during my office hours and we can check your solution. Uh, the next problem is for the parking design. Again, um, some of you were not able to get the right number of, of modules. In this case, there were six. Um, some of you uh, designed for the circulation lanes, but then when computing the total number of spaces were not right in terms of choosing the lanes that were affected by the circulation lane. So for instance, in this case, we have um, 44 
uh, for those lanes that were not affected, 44 spaces for those lanes that were not affected by the circulation lane, and 41 spaces for the ones that were affected by the circulation lanes. So in total, there were 10 lanes that were affected by the circulation lanes. The only two that were not affected were the ones on the corners. All right, so you had two lanes with all parking uh, spaces that were possible, and then the ones in the middle with only 41. So in total, you got 40, 498 spaces. And the solution should be the same for all of you because the area for the space was uh, 400 by 400. So it was a square. Okay. Um, so this is what I was referring to. You have 12 lanes, this one and this one got 44, and then the rest of them only 41. Yes. So, like, I think in the example, um, they had like a little bit less building, so there's like uh, didn't divide anything. Also, like no assisting. But what yeah. point do you like add another lane at the top? That was because you have six point five. Okay. So it was half uh, a module available. So what, was it more than half? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so you can have a half a module there. Yes. Correct. Any other question? Good. And then this one was, again, similar to one of the problems that we covered in the assignment. Um, so what I, what I found here is that some of you forgot to account for the defect rate. So you use 50, I'm sorry, 5,000 parts per week without considering the defect rate. So you had to compute that um, QV value before attempting to determine the number of machines. Uh, so that's what I'm presenting here. You have the QV, QA. QV is gonna be equal to the input of B that is taking into account the effective rate. So 5,263 units. And then QA, given the defective rates of both machines, A and B, 5,371. And then using those numbers, you and also using the right units for the time, you were able to compute the total number of machines. Uh, total was 15. Um, seven of type A and eight of type B. And that was the, the example. Questions? So again, if you don't want to ask questions now, you feel that you want to see what, what was wrong with your answers, why do I take points? Welcome to join my office hours this afternoon at 3.30 and we can cover or answer your questions. No questions? Good. So I'll stop here and then we'll meet again on Monday.